You're now experiencing data with Brian O'Neill. Experiencing data explores how product managers, analytics leaders, data scientists, and executives are looking at design and user experience as a way to make their custom enterprise data products and analytics applications more useful, usable, and valuable. And now, here's your host, the founder and principal of Designing for Analytics, Brian O'Neill. Welcome back, everybody. This is Brian O'Neill. This is Experiencing Data, and I'm, I'm happy to have Kareem Lakani here from Harvard Business School, and you have a new book. Tell us about your book. Yeah, great to be here, Brian. Yeah, the book is called uh, Competing in the Age of AI, When Algorithms and Networks Run the World. This is a uh, co-author with, with my good friend um, and colleague here at HBS, Marco Iancidi. And the book is really trying to make accessible this AI revolution that is going on in the tech world. But as we make the arguments in the book to really applies to all types of companies. And the book sort of argues that relatively simple AI or weak AI is radically changing the business architecture. So both business models, how companies create value and how they capture value and operating models, how they achieve scale, how they serve lots of customers, how they achieve scope, which is how they provide more and more services and products to their customers and how they learn and improve. And our thesis in the book is that a new type of an organization is emerging, which has eliminated sort of bottlenecks in, in the old processes and that the future of many organizations is to emulate what many of the AI first companies are doing today. Yeah, thanks for that. And and just uh, for listeners who may not know Kareem's work, uh, in addition to you know teaching at Harvard Business School, you also co-founded the Harvard Business Analytics Program. So very relevant to this audience. And wh while I would characterize this as as more of a business book, it's not a technical book on data science. You know your stuff, and so you're able to really relate the tech, the technical aspects here to business. And I, I that was. One thing that I got out of the book, and I'm, I do want to ask you about the analytics a little bit later, but but jumping into the kind of the book portion here, I was curious, like, so what's surprised you since you put the book out there? Have you had any unexpected readers or unexpected comments or anything you might feel like sharing? Oh, yeah, sure. So two things. One, I put the book out there, you know, and I let my form. I've been at HBS for 15 years. So let some of my students know, all of my former students in the MBA program know, hey, this book is coming out. You might want to buy it and read it. <laughs> uh, I can't assign it to you anymore, but you should definitely still read it. And one of them wrote back, he's in, in digital at, at, a, at a large you know, consumer company. And he goes, you know, in this cryptic email, the subject line says, you know, about your book. I'm like, oh, shoot, you know, this guy doesn't <laughs> like the book. And he goes, it looks like you wrote the book just for me and the, the challenges and issues I'm facing today in my company. And I was like, OK, mission accomplished <laughs> that, you know, at least my students, uh, my former students found it relevant. And then the second thing, you know, in the book and, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about this. We, we make this argument that sort of the digital operating models are colliding with traditional product businesses. And the digital operating models, you know, have sort of an exponential sort of scaling properties and in terms of the value they generate versus the traditional companies have basically, you know, what we call, you know, uh, like a concave uh, function. Like they, they basically have value curves that basically flatten out and have, have fixed capacity. And that over time that these digital operating models collide with these traditional product models and win over customers and, and gather huge amounts of, of market share and, and, and market value. This notion of collision, you know, has come alive in today's crazy COVID world too. So the argument we make in the book is like, look, you know, the, the traditional companies don't see this happening, res respond too late and are really suffering a ton because of these of these of these collisions and guess what the same thing happened with covid right covid is a disease that has an exponentially growth process right and it's colliding with hospital capacity healthcare capacity that is fixed and when we talk about flattening the curve it's all about trying to avoid this collision and the whole world basically faced an exponentially rising system that we didn't understand, we ignored, we wished it away. 
especially you know in in Europe and in the Americas. And now we're paying the price for that. And the same thing that we sort of talked about in our book about digital systems, same thing is happening with COVID. So in many ways, that was like a like a unwelcome realization <laughs> of you know what we sort of saw happening in the business world happen to the rest of the world as well. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, challenging times for sure. It reminds me a little bit about you. You kind of talked in the book about the you know the the echo chamber and re, you know reinforcement of uh, certain types of you know, political messaging. And we talked about you know the anti vax movement and how you know these model you know the network system amplifies certain message over and over to <laughs> to you know to certain groups of people. They they can start hearing the same same types of messages over and over. And it kind of what you just said there about COVID nineteen. This kind of exponential growth kind of reminded me of that that part of your book as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like in the book, we, you know, actually the, the, the toughest chapter to write in the book was the ethics chapter because, you know, we're business school professors. You know, of course, we want to be ethical, and but we don't study that as an object of scholarship. There's other experts in the philosophy department or in the law school and so forth that sort of think about that. But as we were writing the book, we felt it really important to actually have a, a question and address his worries about sort of how do we think about uh, the ethics of digital scale, scope, and learning, right? Like if you build an operating model that is that is going to scale exponentially, then how do you actually think through the ethical questions as well? And that, you know, you can't have like an ethics department at the, after the fact, right? You need ethics to be built into both the engineering teams and the management teams and how we design our algorithms, how our systems work have to be ethically designed. You know, I teach in the technology and operations management course here at HBS for MBAs, and we have a case on the Toyota production system. And one of the questions you ask is like, where is the quality department in Toyota? Well, guess what? There is no quality department in Toyota because quality is built right in, right? And I think the same thing is going to be needed around AI and machine learning systems uh, in companies too, that, that, that ethics will have to be an engineering consideration and a business consideration from day one. It can't be ex post at all. So this ethics, I, I'm glad there is a, as I was reading the book, I was kind of waiting for something about this to be stated. You know, my, my practice is human centered design and trying to, you know, help the data community use human centered design, which I feel is a, is a more micro approach to ethics because we're putting people at the center of our work and it forces us to think about the human experience with these technologies. And so I'm curious, I, you know, I actually con contributed an essay. There's a new book coming out on, on ethics and AI, and it's a bunch of essays from different writers. And, and I contributed one. And even though, you know, I'm a designer, I'm also not, uh, I'm not an ethics scholar or anything uh, along those lines. Did you feel a little bit of imposter syndrome writing about that? Despite the, I, I totally agree with you that everyone that's working on these systems, it, this isn't a department. You know, it's not a check. It's not a ch a checklist item as you go through your you know yeah. delivery sequence. Did you feel a little bit like out of place writing? You said it was difficult, but I, I felt a little bit that way. The same here. That was that was a real difficulty because again, um, I mean, I think I think again, you know, we take scholarship seriously. You right. know, you want to defer to the experts in in that domain, mm -hmm. but but I think I think a well rounded data science education both for executives and leaders and managers and engineers and technologists will have to include ethics dead on because I think the, 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 and so we can't, we can't anymore shy away from it. Like you have to address it up front. Like, you know, the example I often give in these situations, I talk about bias, right? Like human, all human beings are flawed and we have biases, you know, and, you know, in, in the, analog systems in the traditional systems, those biases can be limited, right? Because we sort of limit our footprint naturally. So if you have like a bank manager that's biased and doesn't give loans to a particular class of people, that thing is, is bad, but it's still limited. If we now train off many of these bank managers and they're all biased, and then all of a sudden our data are biased and our algorithms are biased, then we're going to be discriminating at scale. <laughs> and this is exactly the problem that, you know, Apple faced when they realized when the Apple card got released that, you know, that the, the algorithms that they were working with, with Goldman Sachs and themselves were discriminating against women and giving them less credit in the same household. And they said, well, you know, we don't have gender in our models. Well, 
duh, you don't need gender in your models to have ad additional correlates that, that, that are additional variables that are perfectly correlated with gender. So mm -hmm. you've got to actually understand both the science behind this, but then what the consequences of these things are going to be as well. So, so we finally got over our reluctance and said, look, we're just going to, you know, sort of lay out the, the, the issues and we give a ton of sort of mini case examples and, and examples in that chapter walking through, you know, issues around transparency, issues around bias, issues around sort of uh, selective amplification and echo chambers and say, look, this, this is no longer, you know, the, the data scientists, the, the managers, the executives can't just say, oh, we didn't realize what we were doing. <laughs> it's like, no, you have to really think through what the, what these implications are. And, and so, so I'm still uncomfortable about it and I read a ton around it, but I think, I think this is no longer something that, that should be left to the specialists. This, we have to make this mainstream in this, in this community. Yeah. If there, if there are any ethicists listening to this, you also just dropped an, probably an amazing book title called Discrimination at Scale. So I just wanted to throw that out there. If you're looking for a good title for yes. your ethics book, that's a good one. <laughs> we'll probably get to ask you a little bit more on the ethics a little bit later. But I, my next question, uh, so you co-wrote this book with Marco, and, and I'm curious, where did you guys disagree during the book? And did you have any, ever have competing opinions about you know what would finally go into the text? Yeah, so you know, look, I've I've known uh, Mark. Marco's a friend. You know, we've authored a bunch of books, to, a bunch of articles together before, mm -hmm. and he's actually the one who recruited me to come to HBS as I was graduating from MIT with my PhD. I was actually headed west to Berkeley, and Marco convinced me to, to stay, stay in Boston. So, so we have a fairly tight relationship, and and you know, we've been we've been exploring these topics together in a course that we started seven seven years ago now, eight years ago now, on digital innovation and transformation. So we've, you know, we've written a bunch of cases. So our, our perspective was, was already pre-aligned. It wasn't as if it was the first time we were co-authoring. But then there's still, you know, this, this iterative process where, you know, somebody puts paper to pen and then gives it to the other person to react to, and then one of us throws up <laughs> on it. <laughs> and then it's, it's this mutual throw up process until it gets better. But the trick to our book was really our editor, Amy Bernstein. Amy Bernstein is the editor of HBR, and she's edited a bunch of our papers in HBR. And we went with HBR Press because we get Amy to work with us. And Amy really is the midwife of the book. She really would would be the, the skeptical reader saying, really, guys, is that what you really mean? This is, give me a better example. You know, and, and the iterations between Marco, myself, and Amy were critical to this book coming together. So, yeah, but the, but the mutual throw up process was definitely, you know, like part of the, the process. And you get to enjoy that process, right? And you sort of build a thick skin. I mean, I think, I think as scholars, we get so used to, you know, peer review. And peer review typically is like, I hate all your ideas. I hate your writing. Why are you even trying this? as the first go around and you know most stuff gets rejected on the first go around anyway but 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 as so you build a thick skin and and the whole thing is that the, the iterations on writing and smoothing things out and really getting a, an outside perspective as amy provided to us was, was critical to the book uh coming coming together nice nice yeah editors uh thumbs up for, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> for their their absolutely. contributions one of the things i when i was reading the text especially at the beginning I'm not going to say you you were blessing full automation looking at ai as as a tool for complete automation there's at least in the circles that i hang out in there's kind of this uh, there's this there's this human in the loop scenario right where we're using ai to augment human decision making versus yes. full automation uh you cite netflix and, and talk heavily about netflix there and i couldn't help but think you know netflix risk is like really low so yes. i think they can automate everything because yeah. recommending a bad movie isn't yes. really going to hurt anybody yes. do you have a position on this and was there an intention to kind of were, were you really trying to show the kind of the aspirational place that companies could get to with full automation because i feel like that's just places you know there's a lot of companies struggling to just get any model out the door yeah. let alone one that's fully automated it it, it, it sounded like such a, a a reach a little bit from just What's happening on the ground? I don't know. Can you talk a little bit about this? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And I think about this a lot. So I, I, I'm going to sort of first start with like 
many of us today use products and services that are already fully automated, right? So like, you know, when you do a search on Google, right, there's no, you know, million dwarves in the, in the, in the minds of Silicon Valley that are, you know, finding the search results for us and magically giving us those answers, right? You know, there's no search goblins that Google has access to, right? Or people, right? It, this is literally in a fully automated way. There's no way Google can provide its services to us today with people doing those services. The people create the software and the algorithms, but the algorithms do all the work. And that's both in the search side, but also in the ad side, right? They have salespeople that, that drive contracts between Google and the media organizations or advertisers or whatever, but the actual creation of the match between your search term and the ad is all fully automated, right? So, so Google is one example. And same thing in Facebook, right? You know, and then one of the examples we have in the book also is like Ant Financial, which is a Chinese-based juggernaut of financial services company, spun out of Alibaba. You know, they serve 1.2 billion customers, and I think probably by now they maybe have 20,000 employees or so. Uh, at the time when we were writing the book, they had you know 15,000 employees with uh, you know maybe 750 million customers or something like that, or 10,000 employees, and. They have a process that's like 310 for like for opening up a new account, right? It takes you three minutes to fill out the application, one second for approval, and zero human intervention, right? There's no way you can run a company with 1.2 billion customers and have humans do much of the activities, right? Again, it has to be algorithms, it has to be people. So we pushed our thinking to say, what does a fully automated company look like? There's room for lots of people, but the people aren't the bottlenecks, right? These aren't manual processes driving it, that they are actually done fully automated way. But I think you raise a good question. Like, I, I mean, I think this human in the loop conversation is an important one for us. So, so like autonomous driving, right? Do you, do you want human in the loop with autonomous driving? I don't know, because it's kind of like, you know, I'm going to be checked out a bunch of times until there's an emergency. Then all of a sudden, my reactions have to be superhuman fast to be able to avoid that accident. I don't know. <laughs> you know, so so even there, I think the human the loop processes are are potentially, in fact, could could be worse than than other other ways. But more generally, what I when I when I when I come to this conversation with people, you know, take for example, in radiology uh, or in X-rays. Right, extra diagnoses, right? And then when would you want a robo doctor to give a diagnosis versus a human doctor? And you can think through various ways as why this would be good or bad and so forth. But what I want to sort of remind people is that we should go back to you know the confusion matrix, right? Which is standard in, in machine learning, which basically has, you know, it's a two by two. So one axis you can think about in terms of the detected state. Is it positive or negative of some, about some, some, some prediction, some decision? And the actual state, positive or negative. And then you basically then start to construct an analysis that says, you know, I want to sort of think about false positives and false negatives, right? So imagine in the bank loan situation or in a cancer diagnosis situations, false positives and false negatives. And then you want to have a conversation that says, what is the cost, the real cost, not just dollars and cents, but the real cost of making a false positive and, and false negative by the machines. And we can extract that. And then it, from there, we can get into sens sensitivity and specificity and so forth. But just let's just stick with false positives and false negatives, right? And then you go, okay, what's the, what's the cost of doing that? What's the, what's the actual rates of false positives and false negatives? For machines and then we want something similar for humans right for the experts right we want the counterfactual analysis and then we can make a decision to say okay in what situations would we want the machines to be better than humans in what situations would we want the machines to be equivalent to humans and in what situations do we, are we okay when the machines are worse than humans right so in your example like if 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 netflix gives me a movie recommendation you know it's okay that it's a crappy one now, if it continuously does that to me, I might like get sick of Netflix and not go there anymore. But but in in the moment, it's okay, right? And so so if the false positive rates are high in in Netflix, that might be okay. But if you are in, let's say, diagnosing COVID, 
right? Mm -hmm. You don't want you don't you don't want a high false negative rate, right? Because that gives you a false impression that you're not uh, you're not uh, you don't have the disease and that you're not infectious, and then you're going to go out there and infect like a uh, hundred people because you're going to go hang out at the beach and and meet and, and party and that kind of stuff. So we have to be contextual. So this whole question about human in the loop, I think, is important and it's not going to go away. But we need to start thinking about well, well, how good are the humans anyway, <laughs> right? So like, imagine pricing, right, or even like fashion assortments, right? How good are the humans in making in, in getting false positive rates and false negative rates, right? And then what are the consequences when those happen? And then do we have the systems in play? So I, that's why, you know, we teach, we teach this to our, our executives in our analytics program. We go through, we go, look, you need to have a, a proper conversation about the risks of false positive and false negatives in the context. Build a counterfactual of what, what do the existing systems do with people and then have the discussion to say, how might the machines help you along the way? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with you. It's not it's not even desirable and like, you know, for search or Netflix or whatever. I don't want to wait 15 minutes for a human to say, try these movies. No, nope, those suck, yeah. too. You know, <laughs> that's not but, a but, great. But, but that was, you know, but, but but Brian, this was so interesting because that's exactly why, you know, <laughs> Blockbuster died. Mm -hmm. Right. Because they felt like everybody wanted to go to the movie store, buy popcorn and talk to their you know, their, their, their local video nut who would tell you what movies to watch, right? I think there's two sides to that, though. I mean, you know, my other careers as a musician, and I can tell you that really diehard music fans, a lot of them really miss record stores and, and Spotify providing automated recommendations. There, there's something about that experience that is not the same when, when you learn to trust a, 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 a source there. So I, I guess I think I'm thinking of this more on community lines. Uh, maybe another example might be, let's take a, a minority or someone that's on the fringe, something about their profile, their demographics or something goes in to get the loan, right? Yes. So is every is every bank going to only be fully automated in its loan decision making down the road, including a small local community bank in a community, you know, maybe the community has 20,000 people in it or 10,000 people in it. And this person that needs the loan is actually Perhaps they're well known in the community and people, you know, can see what this person's trying to do, but oh, they had a felony and, you know, they fell on bad times or whatever it may be. And they're kind of an exception, but there's a human element there that would say, you know, the bank wants to support this person, even if the risk is high. And I just wonder if, the, if we get to a place where there's there's no recourse for that. And, and maybe the, the issue here is really escalation to level two, right? You get denied and now you can appeal and it goes through a human process or something like that. And maybe that's a bad example, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think banks are notorious for doing the opposite, but that's, that's besides the point, you know, well, yeah, redlining like, and banks and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that. what's the training data, right? Cause yes, you need no, the right, 100, it's 100%, like, and that's when, why we're back to the ethics conversation that, yeah. that, that, that those things, but at least we can be accountable and measure things. Right. And I, no, I look, I, I, I agree. I, I think though, look, I think the thing is, in all cases where technology comes in, there is sort of an existential crisis that goes on. I think I think my favorite example sort of is when photography got invented, right? When photography got invented, the European art scene was in crisis because still life was the measure of how good an artist you were. And now guess what? <laughs> Any joke could be a good still life uh, artist because you could just capture still life. Right. And then guess what? Th that crisis led to modernism and gave, you know, gave birth to, to Picasso. Right. And so 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 I think the, the difference now is that this existential crisis is happening across fields you in music and banking and the arts, you know, you name it. You know, we start our, our, our book with this next Rembrandt example as well. And I, I think the thing is, how does the curation bit now show up differently on Spotify or through other media. So now, you know, I love music as well. I'm not a musician, but, you know, I now have to sort of resort to a bunch of blogs and a bunch of different people to sort of figure out what new music to listen to so that the algorithm and Spotify don't, you know, bring me back to a Tribe Called Quest over and over again, <laughs> who I love. And so, and so, so there's th these alternatives. Now, now, is it the same as the guy you knew at the record store? Well, maybe that guy, you know, maybe that was a good guy for you, but maybe not for me, right? right. Maybe you yep. just always be recommending death metal over and over again. So I think this creates opportunities for new forms of engagement.
But those things take time. There's a transition period when society figures out how we do this in a different way or in a, in a, in a new way. And I think that's important. Like, look, look my, one of my favorite examples of this is like, you know, Peloton as a company, right? You think about the fitness experience and, you know, like, like what SoulCycle did for, for Spin and how Peloton has a brand new architecture of taking the same components that have always been out there, a studio, an instructor, you know, digital, bringing your bike into your home, and then now you can scale in a very different way. And I tell you, you know, Peloton, I feel like I have a, a personal relationship with my instructors <laughs> on Peloton, even though I maybe I follow them on Instagram. And, you know, but I know these guys inside out, and I love doing my classes with those guys. And, and there's a community of people, the community of people is all around the world that I interact with. I do this particular type of training on the Peloton called Power Zone Training you know, and so on. And now all of a sudden, you know, I've, I've got uh, fellow athletes that I, I, I'd be overstating it to call myself an athlete, but uh, fellow workouters <laughs> from around the country doing the same type of training with me. And we train together and we encourage each other and so forth. And before I couldn't even, you know, get my butt into the gym that's across the street from me. So, 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 you know, I mean, so I think, I think, I think there's like a, there's a real opportunity for for designers, for engineers, for entrepreneurs to sort of take what these technologies are for you and then do something brand new. Will it be the same as what was there before? Of course not. It's going to change. But we want to take advantage of the new things and see what how those experiences translate over. Well, I, I did want to let you know there is a weekly, every day of the week, soccer game, right at the Cumnock turf fields, right behind you. So you have I know, no excuse. But, but you know, that's the problem, right? Like, like I, you know, like my, literally my gym, the gym in my, at HBS, the Shad Center, beautiful gym, literally is the next building over. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, I've been a faculty member for 15 years and maybe I've been there maybe 50 times in 15 years. <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah. When I got like when I got inspired, okay, I really got to go work out. And then now having Peloton now in my in my house in the basement, and then just having the structure has been you know at least life changing for me. But but the, again, the whole point is that I think I think there, that the as these technologies get infused in our lives, there will be an adjustment period, and we hope that this adjustment period leads to better experiences. Uh, will we miss the old things? Of course we will. I mean, that's, that's how human beings are. But I think, I think, I think if we sort of also think about what is it, what else does it open up for us? I think we can be positive about it. Yeah. And I, I, am not casting an opinion. I mean, I, I work in this space as well, but I, I feel like the, you know, I think, I don't know who said this, someone, some ethicist said like ethics defines the boundaries of what you care about, you yeah. know, <laughs> and yeah. it make, you know, and I think that's a really important question. And sometimes I wonder whether or not that's going to become Oh, well, we'll do that in phase two, you know, because companies are struggling just to even get the basic technology out the door. And, mm -hmm, and I can mm -hmm. see it easily being like, we'll get to that later unless we get a New York Times front page article and then we'll definitely spend some time. Yeah, yeah, you, you know, it's just, Absolutely. you know, so and maybe that also means, yeah, now there's room for, you know, local record stores again because everything else is fully automated and, you know, yeah, and <laughs> so I, and now I, there's an opportunity for exactly, that for those I think, people. I think what I know? would say also is that, the, look, I think, I think the, like, if you don't adapt, you're going to get killed, right? Yeah. And so that's, that's the thing that people get stuck in. Like, you're going to mm -hmm. get, you literally get, and that's what happened to, you know, Neiman Marcus, <laughs> right? That's what happened to Blockbuster as an example, right? Mm -hmm. That, 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 and that the, the thing is also that consumers aren't sentimental, <laughs> You know, like, 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 I, I, I get the demise of the of the record store, right? I do, uh -huh. but majority of customers don't care. Yeah, right? they're happy with the the new experience on Spotify. Right? Yeah, I would, I would agree. Right, and also like, like even worse. Like I remember Spotify came out, and I think I think Bette Midler had complained about you know how low her royalties were from Spotify, right? Mm -hmm. Even though there was millions of streams. And it's like, guess what? Bette Midler fans didn't care. Right? They didn't start writing her bigger checks, right? Or sending her money directly. They said, this is the new world, get used to it. And you know, too bad for you that you didn't negotiate better contracts with your record companies and the record companies are keeping all those profits, but that's a separate conversation. But 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 this shift in, you know, 
music as a as a capital good, personal capital expenses that we made. You know, we we, we bought, you know, we bought LPs, we bought eight tracks, we bought cassettes, we bought CDs, right? Then we bought iTunes, and then it shifted to streaming. And in that model, we went from acquis- acquiring sort of music goods to subscribing to them. I think consumers didn't care one bit. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, oh. the, you're right. This, this is a longer conversation. Yeah. I didn't mean to make this into like a music discussion. No, 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 no so, but I love it. No, music, I mean, e- just think about the impact, you know, platforms and AI and algorithms are having on music. It's exactly the right conversation for us to have because that's has radically changed the business. Right. Sure. I mean, I, but again, I think then you have to you have to ask what you care about. You know, there's there's arguments about, you know, Spotify does not have a great reputation with a lot of the music community, despite the fact uh, the consumers really like it. You know, the model of how royalties are paid out. You know, for example, you like you said you like Tribe Called Quest. Is that what you said? Yeah. So if you do you pay for Spotify? Yeah. Yeah. You, so you pay 10 bucks a month or whatever. Oh, we have a family subscription. Or OK, so, so whatever. You, let's just pretend it was you 10 bucks a month. So if you listen to Tribe Called Quest 80 percent of the time, should they get eight dollars per month of your money? Or should it be spread across the biggest song plays, the Taylor Swifts of the world, or whoever it may be, even though you don't like Taylor Swift? I like so, Taylor Swift too, but yes. but yeah. Right, but you see my point, <laughs> yeah, right? Yes. Like it's not weighted towards the artists that you listen to, yeah. which can, uh, you know, and so now you've got art, the touring market is harder, the streaming, you can't make any money with streaming anymore. Yeah. Direct-to-fan actually is a thing, you know, that that is, yeah. the, the diehard fans do support yes. through direct-to-fan purchase and stuff. But I think, again, what, what do you care about as a business if you're going to move into full automation? And some of this isn't really about AI so much, but you know, uh, uh, anyhow, <laughs> no, no, that's no, my uh, take on all that. No, let's have another like, podcast about music. <laughs> let's uh, do that. That would be. There's fun, actually but. there's actually a great a former <laughs> student of mine, Sherry, who has has done a lot of thinking about it oh, yeah. and writes about it. I don't know if you've She's seen her. She's awesome. Yeah. So so yeah, I would I would uh, you yeah. should bring her on <laughs> totally and, and bring um, me on. And we can, I love music. I have no 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 skill on it, but we, okay. can, we can chat. <laughs> I I want to jump back to something probably a little bit more relevant to our current audience, and and I love that you brought this up. I think this is super missing right now. And and it, so in my own work, I kind of have these two camps. I you know I have my my core, which is my old tech my tech world, right? Software companies they yeah. build commercial software products. And then you have all the non-digital native companies that are trying to you know, work on their digital strategy. They're at different places, whether it's AI or otherwise. Um, the product manager. Yes. This role does not exist in a lot of places. I call it the data product manager. Um, there's no hub. There's no central person uh, in a lot of these places. And I wonder if this is why there's continually, you know, study after study shows analytics, BI, you know, AI, the, the failure rate is super high yeah. and, and I feel like it's they don't always know what problem they want to solve. No one is thinking about the end to end experience. Yes. The, the tools aren't designed around what people want to do. They're usually in, they're, they're pushed onto employees. Talk about this product. I was surprised to see I was not expecting to see someone talk about it. I was like, yes, finally, you know, <laughs> where did this come from that, that you think product management in a non software company is is important? Yeah, look, I think I think I think. I mean, even this notion of non-software company or non-digital company, right? That's like, (laughs) yeah, I know. Which company? Which company is not? Like, I I I know. Sure. You know. You know. Even like, you know. Again, in the current times, like you know, like the Toast app is everywhere, right? And so now, all of a sudden, all restaurants, like all of a sudden, in the last few months, all restaurants menus are online. We don't have these crazy PDFs to look through, right? And I can now purchase uh, stuff, you know, restaurants that I couldn't get into before for whatever reason. Now I can access through the Toast app or whatever other app and, you know, get access to them and so forth. But, but, but look, I think the technology, the, the argument in the book is like, like we we can no longer put technology to the IT group and it just sits in the basement and, you know, technology is infused now in everything that we do. And then companies will need to make choices about, about their strategies around this, right? And certainly the generations that are, that are coming forth, you know, my daughter who's 16 and her friends and the generations, you know, just before her and after her are, are you know, natively digital. Like they, they're not going to put up with, with sort of non-digital processes to interact with companies. 
Mm -hmm. And so, and so, so this notion that the, the product manager role, somebody who, who actually understands both the technology and the business, I think is crucially important and can do the end to end view, right? What does the customer experience look like? And what do we need to deliver it in order? What do we need to do internally to be able to deliver on that? That role is just not well understood outside of the tech business. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's crucial. And that requires, again, this intersection of technical skills and business skills. And that's in many, I think that's why there's so many failed digital transformation efforts. There are so many failed AI efforts, right? Or they just stay at the pilot stage, right? Because if you truly understand the customer experience, you truly understand what customers want and how your digitally transformed services and products will, will do that, then you will going to drive for a ton of change inside the organization as well, right? And part of, part of why lots of companies fail at AI projects, a lot of companies fail at the data transformation projects or the digital transformation projects is because they're, they just think I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm going to do Hadoop or I'm going to do Snowflake or, yeah. you know, whatever, whatever the latest buzzword is. Right. And all of a sudden I check that box and it's great. And the reality is that that's, that's, that's neither necessary or sufficient for you to be able to be successful in this space. And you need to, you need human capital, you need people who are, who can intersect both sides, but have a customer orientation first and foremost. And can can galvanize the tech teams and the operations team to be able to deliver on this new experience, but that that requires organizational change. And I think the reasons why all these pilots fail to go beyond pilots is because the companies aren't ready to do the organizational change needed to deliver on these things. I think the technology part, in many ways, I think is the easier part. I think it's the org change part, which I think is the harder part. Are you tired of building data products, analytics solutions, or decision support applications that don't get used or are undervalued? Do customers come to you with vague requests for AI and machine learning only to change their mind about what they want after you show them your user interface, visualization, or application? Hey, it's Brian here, and if you're a leader in data product management, data science, or analytics, and you're tasked with creating simple, useful, and valuable data products and solutions, I've got something new for you and your staff. I've recently taken my instructor-led seminar, and I've created a new self-guided video course out of that curriculum called Designing Human-Centered Data Products. If you're a self-directed learner, you'll quickly learn very applicable human-centered design techniques that you can start to use today to create useful, usable, and indispensable data products your customers will value. Each module in the curriculum also provides specific step-by-step -step instructions, as well as user experience strategies specific to data products that leverage machine learning and AI. This is not just another data viz or design thinking course. Instead, you'll be learning how to go beyond the ink to tap into what your customers really need and want in the last mile so that you can turn those needs into actionable user interfaces and compelling user experiences that they'll actually use. To download the first module totally free, just visit designingforanalytics.com slash the course. One thing that always surprise, kind of surprises me is you, uh, you, you hear sometimes the, the non-digital natives worrying about a tech startup coming around and, and, and eating their, <laughs> eating them up. And I wonder, well, why aren't you copying the way they build digital services, yes. which typically there's a trifecta of product management, product design, and a technical lead, a software architect, an engineer, data scientist, someone that represents what is possible. You need all three of those things to deliver good digital services. And if you only have one of them or two of them, the risk goes up of building something no one will use, whether it's your employees who refuse to adopt this application tool thing that you're pushing on them, or it's actually the end customer's experience. And it kind of baffles me that, you know, when we hear about these failure rates, it's like, well, why, why aren't you copying how they're doing it and not just the technology stack? Because an API endpoint, you know, oh, we were using Snowflake and Hadoop or whatever. It's like, but that's not that's the customer doesn't care about whether it's in the cloud or whether your storage is on prem or not. 
that doesn't have anything to do with their interfacing with the service and whether they choose to use the recommendation from your model or they go against it. You hear, I've heard this repeatedly about salespeople that don't want to use the numbers provided by the model in the contracts. Like I will negotiate the price myself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> And it's like, because they weren't involved in the process that the tools yes. were not designed around the way salespeople uh, want to do their job. And they weren't at the table when it was made. And, and these skills are not the same as building the model and deploying the, you know, DevOps and all the other technical stuff. I don't know. Do you hear that too? That's, that's I totally, I get that <laughs> all the time. And I, and I think that's because I think, I think, I think these established companies, uh, organizations, you know, have a tough time with the change process. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so, 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 so then they don't, they don't include the designers, include the product managers, include the technical folks together. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and you have to basically build a different way, deploy a different way, drive adoption a different way than what you're used to doing. And sadly, I don't think, I don't think the many companies sort of realize that and then they struggle. Yeah. I, I, I liked you, you mentioned that the Azure cloud and I think they, they dog fooded it, right? The new leader came in and said, I want you guys to use this tool. And they realized just how hard it was to adopt it internally. And so they made it a mission to, to, to work on the usability of the service in order to drive the adoption. Can you recount that a little bit better than yeah, I just did? Yeah, look, I, look I, th I, th I think the whole, the whole notion is um, more broadly, there is this notion of like doing something for yourself first and then creating a service around that. Right. So, you know, the classic example, of course, is AWS, right? Amazon had to build a scalable infrastructure for their data centers. They figured that out and they said, oh, now that we built this, can we offer it to other people as well? So y your company as customer zero is really important. And I think I've seen the same thing happen, you know, with Adobe as well as they built out their their marketing cloud, their experience cloud, which is that they, they realized that, that, you know, we talk about this thing called the AI factory in the book where, you know, we think that every company is going to need this AI factory. They had to build the AI factory for themselves and be the first customer, customer zero first to say, can we do our own marketing this way? And have we, have we perfected the process? And once we've done that, then I can offer it to others. And I think it's the same thing in the Azure story. If you don't, you know, and this is, this is old, old wisdom from, from Microsoft way back when, right? Each own dog food, right? Yeah. Like, you know, you know, Michael Cusumano, and David Yoffe discovered this in their work in the 90s about how Microsoft competed, right? Eating your own dog food is really important because like if you're not your own users, you're not going to be you're not going to be able to satisfy customer needs. And you know, HP talked about this when they were inventing oscilloscopes, right? Like they're like, you know, the next bench, your customer is the next person over and make sure that they actually get to use it or not. Again, I think that the 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 problem is that we don't embrace the customer journey properly and really take it and, and and we take it for granted like we somehow we understand we understand our customer models but we don't actually we don't really and and i think i think you know this this azure example of them basically saying if we can't use these same services at scale in our own operations then they're not worth putting out there is 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 the is the is the main lesson that i think all of us should be following put yourself as the user and use it <laughs> like don't go to don't go to cut don't go to focus groups don't show me powerpoint decks show yeah. me your use experience yeah right then we can talk about it yep yep i'm t totally with you there I, one of the in the design community sometimes we talk about you know the the ultimate design maturity is an organization that's willing to hold back a release because the experience is not good enough yeah. and it takes a long time to get to that point where someone said yeah the text there yeah the qa passed but it's way too hard to use. No one can get to the end of it. No one can do, you know, we can't achieve the outcome we want. We built an output. We didn't create an outcome yet though. And so we need to go back and get that right. I, I think that's rare, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I agree. <laughs> I've been talking to Kareem Lakani here. He just wrote a, a great text. I guess not just wrote it, what, six months ago, competing in the age of AI, is that? Is yeah, months? it came out uh, January 7th. So actually it got written last summer. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Publishing I, I want, still takes a long time, apparently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did want to um, just transition one little last question here as we kind of wrap up. But uh, so you're also the founder of the Harvard Business Analytics Program. And we I kind of touched on this earlier. This this There's this heavy failure rate in the analytics world with, with, the, with the tools and applications and dashboards and 
data that they put out. And I'm just curious, like, are, are you addressing that in, in the curriculum for the students? And like, what, what, what change is being made for the young people coming into the field such that we don't continue this 10 year trend from the studies or I've read, at least the numbers don't really get any better. It yeah. seems, Do you, are you addressing that in a certain way or? Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, uh, first the uh, shameless plug analytics.hbs.edu. That's where you find out more about our program. <laughs> and you know, these guys aren't youngsters who are taking our course. So, so this is a fully online program that's offered. We call this the three shields program at Harvard. So it's the Harvard business school, the Paulson School for Engineering and Applied Sciences, our engineering school, and also the Faculty of Arts and Science and the Stats Department. Now, the, just a little bit of an inside track for you guys about Harvard. Shields are like je jealously guarded by their, their schools. Right? They don't want to give away shields at all by each of the schools at, at Harvard. And I think only the president, you know, Larry Bacow, has full access to all the shields. Everybody else has to stick to their own shields. So for us to be able to have a three shields program that I can in my own certificates that I give out at graduation is like is a is like a pretty awesome accomplishment and in, in all our, our marketing materials and all our PowerPoints, you know, we have the three shields. And I remind all of my Harvard colleagues that I'm a three shields program. There's no there there's a there's, there's a few two shield programs, but most are three shield programs. Like so a how, Michelin star. Exactly, Harvard. exactly. <laughs> so how did this come about? So this came about really to sort of what we realized is that there was hunger amongst executives to uh, learn both the technical stack, understand statistics, systems and programming, and sort of machine learning and AI, understand what the toolkit did and what how it worked, but also its implications for business. And I, I've been, I've always been in my career, professional career, at the intersection of technology and business, and just been lucky to have been, you know, been been at both sides. But 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 many people, both technical folks, but also business folks, were finding themselves in this thing, like our discussion about like, duh, which company is no longer a software company, right? Like that doesn't make any sense. So I think I think many folks have sort of have felt this this need. And the alternatives were like, you, okay, you're gonna go do a master's degree in data science, okay? But that's gonna make you data scientists. That won't give you the business side. And you can go to an MBA, but MBAs gives you a general curriculum. You know, you learn finance and accounting and HR and all kind of stuff. And then there'll be a sprinkling of data science and so forth. But you, you know, so so we said we're gonna have this new offering aimed towards mid-career executives those that are sort of seeing the analytics revolution show up at their doorsteps and are grappling with how do I do this and both on the technical side and, and the business side and then we're going to offer it as an online course where you you get you know you get access to the best thinking and the best knowledge in the in those spaces but you simultaneously get access to the tools and learn about the tools and both what they enable and where they're limited but then there are business applications as well so, so, so you, 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 the, the business stack includes strategy and marketing and operations and leadership. And so we've really tried to build this very highly curated curriculum. It's not a degree program. It's a certificate program. We do all of our instruction through both asynchronous sessions on our video platform and then also live teaching on Zoom. And, you know, the program has been active for two years. We've had about a thousand people in the program now. And some people finish it in nine months and some people finish it in 18 months or two years, depending on what's going on in their lives. And surprisingly, we cover, you know, the broad portion of the economy. So we have people in, uh, you know, coming from technology businesses, but also from healthcare, from consulting, from consumer products, from manufacturing, you name it. And also, you know, even the technical folks, you know, that might have, have specialized a while back but is the, the technical refreshers are good, but then they start to get the business side of things. And similarly, the business folks get the business side of things, the modern thinking, but also the technical side of things as well. And that's the program. And I'm, I'm, it's been one of my favorite things to have started here at Harvard, co-started here. I'm David Parks, who's a former head of computer science at, HB, at, at the engineering school, is, is a co-director and co-founder with me of the program. And it's, it was fun to sort of sit down with him and then design it with the rest of our faculty to say, like, what would a highly curated curriculum look like that addresses the, those issues and, and brings them together?
Cool. I will definitely uh, link that up uh, as well as the book. Is, is Amazon the best place to grab the? Text? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. I'll and we are, we're, you know, we always are hungry. I've become like a five star person, <laughs> so like I care a lot about my reviews now on Amazon because, of course, their algorithms depend on the num- number of stars you get. So we're always looking for reviews of the book on on Amazon and uh, however many stars you want to give us. Awesome. So type in competing in the age of AI uh, into Amazon. You'll find that text there. Um, how can people, Kareem, how can people follow you? Uh, do you, Are you on social media or LinkedIn? Where do you publish? For sure. Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn uh, as well as on Twitter. Uh, okay. And I go back and forth between those two platforms. Uh, on Twitter, I'm Kayla Kani. Kayla Kani. Okay. All right. And I'll, I'll put a, I'll find your, uh, your LinkedIn and, and, and pop that in the show notes as well. So thank you so much. Uh, for coming on Experiencing Data and, and, and talking about your, your book and AI and, and digital. Yeah, thanks so much, Brian. I really enjoyed the conversation and hope to do it again around music. It'll be fun. Well, let's do it. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this episode of Experiencing Data with Brian O'Neill. If you did enjoy it, please consider sharing it with the hashtag Experiencing Data. To get future podcast updates or to subscribe to Brian's mailing list, where he shares his insights on designing valuable enterprise data products and applications, visit designingforanalytics.com slash podcast.